The blockade is finished. We dare not go against the Jedi. Viceroy, I don't want this stunted slime in my sight again. What's up, Meta Nerds? This video is going to pull from all the legends and canon sources out there to understand the Nymordian species, from their biology, culture, history, and impact on the galaxy. Their story begins at Grid Coordinates M10 in the Colonies region, on the planet Nymordia. Their homeworld was the third rock from the sun, in a star system that had four planets, with a total of 25 moons. Their celestial neighbors ranged from molten rock, a toxic wasteland, and an extremely mineral-rich asteroid belt named Sa'ak Suen, which was between them and the gas giant. Nymordia was a terrestrial world with a Class I atmosphere breathable to most species, close in size to Coruscant at 10,830 kilometers in diameter, and covered in deserts, fields, and rainforests. And to understand their biology, we actually have to look at their history first, as they are an evolutionary offshoot of the Duros. Just don't say that to their face. Around 25,000 years before the Battle of Yavin, a colony of Duros were established on Nymordia under their great leader Chal Kahan. The leader and his followers were essentially forced off-world, though the details of why this happened are unknown. Perhaps political violence or a religious cult, we just get the vague fall from grace in Duros culture. And in his later years, Chalal wrote the Encyclical of Historical Greatness, which pushed his fellow Nymordian colonists to try to embrace and maintain their old Duros heritage. Though the language Pak Pak is believed to be derived from Duris, it rapidly diverged to become a distinct language, with Pak Pak referring to not just the musical quality of their guttural croaks, but also the subtle hand movements and body language that added meanings to words. <laughs> which all made it a very difficult language for any alien race to pick up, and is why we almost always see them speaking Galactic Basic. Over several generations, the effects of the much greater gravitational force on Nymordia was having obvious effects. You can see the ancestry in their nose down to their chin, and their red eyes with that line through them, but the cranium shape becomes more rounded, with thicker, more protruding bones, while the change in skin color is likely more due to changes in the atmosphere and diets specifically the dimmer star, and frequent fog and mist that would have often cloaked this colony world. The weirdness of the biology starts with the fact that the females show signs of once having given birth via eggs, but they all give live birth to grubs. These would live in communal hives until the age of seven. All the parents left their grubs in these state-run facilities seemingly without further contact, where they were intentionally given inadequate amounts of food, with the purpose of breeding generations that were increasingly treacherous as the grubs would either forcibly take or find clever ways to steal and store their food in order to survive. Perhaps due to the intense requirements of those original settlers who built a civilization from nothing on a far-off alien world. They felt this system produced the kind of adults needed to survive in this harsh galaxy. But it isn't like this produced a fierce warrior people like the Mandalorians, who wanted only the powerful to rule and believed might made right. Instead, the Nymordians were the worst of both worlds. They were willing to kill anyone who stood in their way, but would do it through backstabbing, and being traumatized by their upbringing, almost all of them were fearful and greedy, with weak minds and a fetish for centralized power and absolute authority held in their leaders. Could not entirely let go of their natural tendency towards subterfuge. They sought duplicity and guile, the way a young grub seeks the safety and warmth of its sleeping niche in the communal hive. Many Coruscanti researchers point out how the original vision of the droid army being controlled by a central command was such an obvious design structure for the Nymordians that they didn't even consider its weakness if that head was cut off. The top-down control of the droid army was an extension of their culture. By 22,000 BBY, they joined the Republic. And while the galactic government tried to crack down on some abusive practices, like fighting the Zygerians and trying to end slavery, it is unlikely other senators really knew what was going on in Nymordian space. Almost all of them tried to repress their memories of their homeworld and upbringing, rising up in the companies that were the precursors to the Trade Federation, being one of the most active people during the expansionist period of the Old Republic era, where the most conniving of them led the movements to colonize dozens of nearby planets. The most lucrative were called Purse Worlds, and these would also serve as the administrative HQs of the fractured Corpo states that led the expansion. The most notable purse worlds being Cato Nymordia, Deco Nymordia, and Koru Nymordia. You can see they got a thing for branding and making sure everybody knew they were from the rejected colonists of Nymordia, not Duros. A distinction their evolutionary cousins were happy to help with. While Nymordians had a chip on their shoulder trying to prove their distinct society, the Duros were tired of being conflated with the cowardly, lazy, greedy people. 
Just looking at that cowardly part alone, there was a saying that Nymordians were the only species with an organ dedicated to worrying, which was really just a quirk in their lung pods, that when they were stressed, the lungs grew in size and convulsed in a strange pattern that made it look like a series of separate organs firing under the skin. Stress could also cause this mottled look in their skin, though some would get this look simply from overeating and they were known to turn a bright pink when nauseated, while doctors often joke that the, quote, principal export of the Nymordian home planet is brainworm rot type C. This disease was just one of thousands that were known to be found breeding in these skin folds, and is why many looked at them as a kind of dirty rat species, because since the time of the Old Republic, they were uniquely notorious disease carriers, and Coruscant even had to forbid travelers from Nymordia, and quarantine their home world altogether from galactic trade and travel on several different occasions something I've not seen for any other planet in the galaxy. There has never been a direct answer for why the case of disease and parasites is so high with them, but some point to their farming. Most of the income on these purse worlds came from their rather ingenious system of fungus farms. Clever in how nothing went to waste, and that it was a self-perpetuating method where the insect hives, beetle hatcheries, and fungus all fed into each other, creating a perfectly cultivated circle of life. Or as its owners saw it, an infinite money cheat code which produced food, medicine, and chemical compounds that they essentially had a monopoly on. They openly bragged about how efficient the system was in distributing their population as well, as the smarter ones rose to manage farms, then entire continents and planets, while the dumb Nymordians worked the actual facilities to make sure the fungus and insectoid livestock were cared for and processed, with increasingly dumber Nymordians working on the lower-ranking worlds, with jewels like Cato Nymordia having the best of the worst lower classes, while their home world Nymordia was considered a hell world, where those grubs who barely escaped starvation in those first seven years of life, whose IQ was so low and their guile so absent that their superiors were surprised they were smart enough to breathe. Those worst of the worst worked in the foggy fungal farms. Everyone else wanted to get out of their homeworld as quickly as possible, never returning and seeing it as a torturous prison. And I think this is the best explanation for their uniquely bad hygiene, as their leadership got a kick out of making an example of the workers on Nymordia, publicly explaining that they feed them less even in adulthood in order to keep their willpower low and function just at maintenance to tend the fungus, but never get any creative ideas like rebellion or a labor strike. And most off-world Nymordians agreed that this was apt punishment for being so weak since the time of the grub hive. While in the back of their minds, they knew that if you failed in business and dropped in social status, you might fall all the way down into these pits of the brainworm-infested hell, which only helped to keep those off-world both vicious and in constant fear, which addled everything from their nerves to skin. 4800 BBY saw them expanding into drug dealing, specifically from other species' native medicines, buying up rights to become the exclusive providers of Rill, the spice from Ryloth that was so potent and addictive that it would later attract the huts. And with Nymordian distribution, whole new epidemics were spread, this time not from the petri dish that was their body, but several species were experiencing mass addictions and death rates only seen at a time of war. Gank were a species famous for their high-tech arms and armor that allowed them to be a go-to people for large bounty hunting missions and private military contracts. Nymordians hired them to put down what felt like a zombie apocalypse, when the porporite species became mindlessly homicidal when exposed to real spice. The Nymordians gave orders to protect their spice facilities at all costs, but the gank mercs were proactive and not waiting for the next wave of zombies to attack them, but went out and systematically slaughtered the entire native population leading to the extinction of the porporites. And it was around this time that the surplus of credits from drug dealing went into fabulous clothing, described as an obsession intended to make others jealous, with symbolic meaning and status symbols packed into every level, from color to the combo and style of robe, cloak, collars, and hats, to the point that many joke that you would never see one without a hat, and the Republic's Xenosociological Database has entire guides to decode the meaning of an Imordian's look. And the importance of fashion was so universally recognized that a disgraced and demoted one would be immediately stripped of their clothes in public at the moment of offense. With expansion and wealth came an ever-increasing problem of piracy. From 1000 to the 400s BBY, the Nymordians were coming to dominate galactic trade, and formed one of the largest navies to protect it. As protection scaled up from the blaster on your hip, to laser cannons on your transport, then starfighters to escort them, and before you knew it, military-grade weaponry was commonplace in an era where the Republic had no standing military of its own. In 1000 BBY, the Jedi believed they had destroyed the Sith. The greatest threat to peace was finally removed. 
So it was actually Finnis Valorum's old descendant, Tarsus, that signed the Rusan Reformations, that reduced the Great Republic military to a police force focused on Coruscant, and let the Jedi get back to being esoteric monks, leaving the rest of the galaxy to look out for itself. There are countless systems who look to the Nymordian-run businesses as the lifeline for their community, providing all the employment opportunities and protection from pirates. This is why in 350 BBY, the Trade Federation was formed, with the Republic's blessing, granting them unique charters and trying to do what it could to incentivize economic growth in the expansion regions, and allow these corporations to defend themselves. Despite their cowardly reputation as a species, their warriors were respected, and their special forces were feared throughout the galaxy. While there was not anything the size of the CIS or Grand Army of the Republic, there were still a ton of violent pirate groups and private militaries, so the Nymoidian Royal Guard should be considered top tier, called Royal for their service to what was being called the Trade Monarch, one who was head of the Nymoidian Inner Circle. This monarch would coordinate with the Senator, and was on the board of the Trade Federation, and was often elected to be the commanding Viceroy. So there were times where the monarch would rule Nymoidian space, and wield power in the larger corporate federation which came to include the most powerful manufacturers, even Republic juggernauts like Kuat Driveyards. In fact, splitting off enough of these companies would be crucial to building an army for the Clone Wars, which required Darth Sidious to get involved in a master plot that is better explained in these videos, and help to create the tensions needed to spark the Clone Wars, as well as creating the corporate sector and other zones we see in Andor. Quickest way to summarize it is that the Trade Federation became so powerful that they got a Senate seat, and the Republic wanted to expand hyperlanes and modernize as much of the galaxy as possible, so these companies had all the leverage. And with the cutthroat, greedy Nymodian leadership at the helm, it wasn't long before countless star systems became totally dependent on the Trade Federation, with the Board of Directors being the true governing body throughout these free trade zones. And when the massacre at the Ariadu Conference killed off all the non-Nymodian members, Newt Gunray was in control of the Trade Federation Directorate, and valuable member worlds like Kuat withdrew. Sidious predicted the next step, that Valorum would push for a taxation of the free trade zones and attempt to break up Trade Federation power forcing all those affected to become even closer allies, aligning the interests of the Intergalactic Banking Clan, Corporate Alliance, and Techno Union against the Republic. The Trade Federation had recently created a new line of defense droids to protect their ships and facilities, working with the Geonosians of Bactroid Armor Workshops to create the B-1, a design that was said to mirror both the Geonosian frame, but also resembled what a dead Nymoidian looked like. When they died, their bodies rapidly dried up, leaving this big oval head on a thin skeletal frame. And then there were the massive trade haulers like the Lucre Hulk that had been ever increasing in firepower for years, with the addition of vulture droid starfighters to protect against the greatest piracy of this era, even with a ground force to protect on-world facilities, protecting them from hostile locals that were either spiced out of their minds or forming another violent union resistance. The Trade Federation military was legal, but their next move was debatable. Begin landing your troops. My lord, is that... I will make it legal. Even the blockade was legal. As you know, a blockade is perfectly legal. But it was the invasion of Thede and forcing the Queen to sign a treaty at the barrel of a blaster that was a step too far. How will you explain this invasion to the Senate? The Queen and I will sign a treaty that will legitimize our occupation here. Due to their previous trade agreements, Naboo could be blockaded on a claim of payments owed, and the hope was that by the time the Senate ever resolved this issue, the Queen would have already been forced to sign her world away. This, of course, didn't go to plan. And the next 10 years were spent with Newt Gunray still as the sole ruler of a humiliated and jaded trade federation, and his secret Sith ally was head of the Republic. In these years, the corporations that would all come to form the Confederacy of Independent Systems were being guided by Count Dooku. When a particularly important party was interrupted by Obi-Wan Kenobi, the Clone Wars was ignited here on Geonosis, with the combined corpo-private militaries engaging the Republic's secret clone army. The war was hard on all Nymordians. Even those loyal to the Republic were met with heavy skepticism and sometimes violence, often seen as CIS spies. It didn't help that Newt Gunray was hitting all those old stereotypes and were seen as the most important element in the Confederacy. Though we see the greatest examples of Nymordian warriors of this time as well, with the Gunnery Battalion drawing on ancient designs of their beetle knight armor, utilizing powerful blaster pistols, developing specialized units like snipers, and genetically modified giants dubbed the Nymordian Brutes. The banking clan would often get in feuds with these traitors, and would end up being a major victor in the Clone Wars. While the Nymordian leadership was killed on Mustafar, having fulfilled their purpose of 30 plus years of planning with Sidious and his old master Darth Plagueis. Lord 
Sidious! Promise us peace! In a comical reversal of the plan on Naboo, the acting viceroy Sentipeth Findos was forced to sign a treaty giving over all rights of the Trade Federation over to the new emperor, making Palpatine the legal head of the Federation overnight. And the first thing to get liquidated under this new management were several major grub hatcheries. Not to be outdone by Anakin's little killstreak, Sidious quickly took out millions of these grub children. Shortly after this, a refuge colony escaped out into the unknown regions and was discovered by the Chiss Mithra Nerodu. There was a desperate plea for the Chiss to help the Nymordians take back the galaxy and knock the Emperor off his throne, but this was rejected by the Chiss ascendancy. But during one of my surveys, I discovered a colony of refugee Nymordians. Once they learned who I represented, they pleaded with me to bring the Chiss to battle against Coruscant. They promised their people would rise up in response, and that together we would bring down Emperor Palpatine and restore the Republic. It was in this time that the book mentioned before, the encyclical on historical greatness, was written, detailing their history on how they parted from the Duros 25,000 years earlier, and it was written with the purpose of convincing his people to give up this animosity for their ancestors. Because in the Imperial era, everyone hated the Nymordians. Obviously, the human-centric imps, the common people saw them as primarily responsible for the Clone Wars, and even smart rebels realized that the insatiable greed was a primary tool of Darth Sidious. Chao Kahn wanted them to try and be seen as Duros, since nobody really hated them. And while their blue brothers did everything they could to deny this at first, it is said that by the time of the New Republic, these species got along pretty well, and Nymordian-run businesses seemed to merge with the Duros, without any major incidents or backstabbing greedy behavior. Though just two years after Endor, in 6 ABY, there was another series of major outbreaks that did stem from Nymordians. With the great pandemic of Dersheba, in the intestinal ravage of Bars Barka, as Naboo merchant Boabob wrote about it, quote, Of course, it should be mentioned here that the Nymordians are notorious virus carriers. Although immune to most harmful microbes themselves, they have been a scourge of the galaxy, responsible, although they deny it, for the great pandemic of Dersheba and the equally lethal intestinal ravages of Bars Barka that created the massive weight loss that swept through the obese colonists. So that's it for the breakdown. As for behind the scenes facts, originally they were to be shown in CGI and meant to be the organic equivalents of B1s, just like humans making Terminators that look like them. But it was decided that it would be better to have them brought to life through animatronic masks. And this unused design was later used in episode 2 for the Geonosians. Perhaps because the CGI got better, and that they would already have to make tons of CGI Geonosians anyways. So even close-up characters like Pago the Lesser were completely computer generated. The original name for their species was Sahatnarian. The name was meant to fulfill an agreement Lucas made with William Shatner way back during the production of A New Hope. They would drink at a bar near Industrial Light and Magic. When all the crazy new alien species of the Cantina were mentioned, Shatner said he wanted a character named after him. This didn't happen, and he backed out of it again for episode 1, and nobody knows where the name Nymordian came from, if it means anything at all. The accent of the Nymordians was based on a Thai actor's reading of Gunray's lines, while the German version has a French accent. And you get a Russian accent in the French, Spanish, Czech, and Italian versions. While in Russia, the Nymordians have a Finnish accent. If you want to read up on them more, sources come from the Essential Atlas, Ultimate Alien Anthology, New Essential Guide to Species, Complete Locations, and a ton of novels from the Darth Maul books, Darth Plagueis, and Canon Thrawn book. But first I want to thank Audible for sponsoring this video. I've been listening to Audible for over a decade, and I can say with full confidence that they have the greatest Star Wars content out there. Tons of Legends books, my favorite are the Bane Trilogy and Revan, and amazing canon books like Dark Disciple, Tarkin, the Canon Thrawn Trilogy, Master and Apprentice, and so many more. In fact, I'd say my favorite canon stories are actually coming from audiobooks, which can get into so much more detail and are true audio experiences, with excellent narration and great background sounds that really help to bring you into the story. As you can see, I make heavy use of the notes feature, and you get so much with your Audible Plus membership that it's really becoming the home of storytelling. With Audible originals and podcasts, and every genre from bestsellers to celebrity memoirs, to history, business, and wellness. I use Audible almost every day, so let Audible help you discover new ways to laugh, be inspired, or be entertained. New members can try it free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash metanerds, or text metanerds to 500-500 to try Audible free for 30 days. Audible.com slash metanerds. Thanks for watching. Like, shares, comments, subscribe, all that stuff helps out the channel. And check out the membership if you want to see more. But most important of all, 
Remember, nobody gets a higher kill streak than Darth Sidious, and the Force will be with you, always.